Hi everyone. So like Zoe just said, I'm Radna Saxena. A little introduction about myself. Um, I did my undergrad back in India for architecture and an internship during that time really spurred my interest into the field of sustainability. It was when I got to assist on a zero waste community there that focused on collective farming, off-grid energy and self-reliance that really made me want to study this further. And that brought me here to Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, where I did my master's that focused in sustainable design. It was here that I also got an opportunity to research at the Intelligent Workplace on campus, uh, which is a living laboratory, meaning it's continually being updated to feature uh, several advanced building systems, materials, which are then essentially tested real time by actual workers in that space. So that was really inspirational for me to look at all of the different advancements that are happening in the sustainability realm. After that master's, my first job was here at the Livy Partnership, which is a building science and sustainability firm. And that is where Zoe and I cross paths. Uh, we got to work on some fun, exciting projects, especially with some federal and state agencies. Currently, I'm working as an associate at Atelier 10, and it's been a super fun and enriching six years so far. Uh, at A10, we are environmental design consultants, but an expertise in a wide range of rating systems, and we always look for finding ways for buildings to tread more lightly on the planet. On every project, we not only take on a challenge of doing more with less, but our approach has really been about supporting the user's health and well-being. So in today's presentation as an agenda, um, I'm hoping to talk a little bit about what wellness means in buildings, the what and the why, talking a little bit more about the elements or components that go into a healthy building, benchmarking and measuring for wellness, as well as how to choose the right wellness certification. We'll end with a little bit of a case study that we have certified right here in New York City. All right, so what is wellness? Now, environmental efficiency has long been a cornerstone of sustainable building design. We've had a focus on reducing energy consumption, optimizing resource use, but in the recent years, there has been an emphasis on wellness that's rapidly catching up and this is because of the recognizing that a truly sustainable environment must also think about the person occupying these spaces. And this shift in mindset really reflects that growing awareness that we can actually create spaces where people can thrive, not only physically, but also mentally and emotionally. So we can design spaces that will influence the way we breathe, we move, we work, and believe it or not, even the way we sleep later on at night. So not only can we design for all these aspects, but we can also measure the quality of wellness in our spaces. What does it mean to bring wellness into buildings? So this is what I think uh, wellness means. It's basically the creating of spaces with more intentional and thoughtful consideration of the physical, mental, and emotional well-being of the occupants as one of the key factors. So this approach goes beyond your aesthetics, functionality, and efficiency. It's also focusing on elements that are enhancing the quality of life of the occupants in that space. It also means looking beyond just building science, looking at other fields, such as psychology, ergonomics, biophilic design, and even medicine, uh, to understand the human body better and actually translate that research into actionable building design interventions and strategies. So let's talk a little bit about why this is starting to get really important uh, more than ever now. A lot of us are a part of this indoor generation, which is a growing population that spends a lot of time indoors, whether it's at home or at work. But this also means that we are all getting prolonged exposure more to our indoor environment quality. So sometimes it can be way more contaminated than the outdoors, making it really important to design those carefully. Also, a lot of scientific studies uh, have shown that people who are in environments that support their well-being 
tend to have higher levels of engagement, satisfaction, and that mindset really translates into productivity and performance across their work or their learning. Health buildings are also just more marketable because people are starting to care more about this and occupants who experience better spaces are also likely to renew their leases more often, stay longer, and that means there's more retention and economic value there as well. The pandemic, uh, that brought about an increased awareness of just how important building design can be for the spread of airborne pathogens. And I think we can all agree here that being stuck indoors for extended periods of time was not fun. But for those of us who spend that time in slightly better spaces with their access to daylight, nature, good air quality, and other strategies, really, it really helped us cope better with some of that stress, anxiety, and isolation that we faced in that time. And then finally, healthy buildings are just more desirable, and they will continue to be so because they are future-proof as more and more awareness grows amongst people. So what really constitutes a healthy building? Um, I personally think that designing a healthy building is like growing a garden. So your garden needs soil with nutrients, it needs water, sunlight, protection from pests. And it's only when all of these things work together that the garden flourishes with thriving plants. So similarly, I think for a building to be healthy, you have to have a comprehensive approach and these are all the design components that need to literally work with each other. So the first one here is air. Um, I think a lot of us are aware of this being a really important component, proper ventilation, high efficiency filters, uh, low volatile uh, organic compound building materials, furnishings, cleaning products that we put in our buildings, maximizing natural ventilation opportunities where it's possible with operable windows, strategic building orientations, um, incorporating indoor plants to remove certain pollutants, incorporating indoor air quality monitoring systems that continuously assess that quality and provide feedback. All of these are elements that go into the air component of a healthy building. Water. So with water, it is really providing the access to clean and safe water. So that could mean always checking on the quality standards, making sure water is free from contaminants and developing systems that not only just monitor our water usage, but also systems that can check for water contamination on an ongoing basis. So you can catch any issues uh, in time. Materials. This one involves intentional choices with non-toxic materials, especially focusing on those high touch, high volume and materials that you're having a prolonged exposure with. I think of this as how you would behave in a grocery store when you pick up a box of something to eat. You turn it around and look at the label to see if that's something you want to put in yourself. So that's the same approach you want with a healthy building. You want to know what's in every material that goes in, read the ingredients, and make the right intentional choice there. Visual. So this one includes both daylight, natural, as well as electric lighting. So providing ample but well-tuned, optimized daylight access, as well as the appropriate illumination levels, minimizing the glare, flicker, and other factors that can really cause discomfort. And here there's also a concept of circadian lighting that comes into healthy buildings, which basically follows our uh, human circadian rhythm. So we are in tune to what time of day it is even when we are indoors, and that really impacts the quality sleep that we get at night. Thermal and acoustic comfort. Uh, this one involves maintaining good in indoor air temperatures with a comfortable range, having that controllability in the environment, and then also performance criteria for indoor ambient noise levels, speech privacy, and also just the furniture layouts to cre create uh, quieter environments. Biophilia. So as humans, we're all genetically predetermined to love the natural world. It's basically in our DNA. So biophilia is really a key component. And we often associate biophilia with just greenery or plants. 
but it's not just that it's anything that you can provide that can give a nod to nature so think of it as natural materials natural forms patterns colors textures anything that provides that little feeling of being close to nature we should also remember that nature is unpredictable it's not a constant so it's very variable so having the variety in your thermal conditions your airflow in the space dynamic lighting all of these really create that experience and finally with biophilia also engaging all of our senses together uh, it's not just the visual it's also the sounds and the smells that can create the connection to nature active design promotes physical activity and exploration so having those spheres that are prominent attractive accessible that people are then uh, encouraged to use them instead of using the elevators and having really good signage that prompts people to get to that active design strategy which which is in the building and finally this one might not be something we think of immediately when we think of wellness safety and security this is still integral because it's only when you are safe that you feel calm and you feel rested so it does impact your mental health as well so providing safety features the, with the amount of lighting with the design of places such as stairwells with handrails non slip surfaces access control systems etc all of these features really prepare the building uh, for safety of its occupants so this is in a nutshell all of the components that i consider to be for a healthy building interestingly passive house already incorporates uh, the essence of wellness into its core and among those components we just discussed these are the three that i think passive house already does a great job to address to quite an extent we all know the superior air quality is one of the main goals of passive house and because it requires air moisture and heat migration to be in check it's also providing those thermally comfortable spaces minimizing noise infiltration and it's also really creating resilience because of its thermal bridge free design and high level of insulation but like i said wellness is something that needs a comprehensive lens so complementing a passive house certification with a separate wellness focused system can be beneficial for a project so the main benefits that i think here is to show a strong commitment to well being so it helps distinguish a building in the competitive market it attracts the health conscious tenants buyers even investors and stakeholders and it really dovetails really well with the green building certifications to create a more holistic approach for both environment and health i'm going to talk about two wellness focused rating systems here the well and the fit well the well building standard was created by delos uh, which is a wellness real estate firm and it is administered by the international well building institute it was really created through a collaborative process um, so it had insights from health sciences building sciences architecture all of them coming together and it also underwent a pilot phase so it was applied to several real world projects and that feedback was used to create this rating system that's fully focused on human health and well-being this system has 10 categories known as concepts so if you're familiar with other rating systems like lead this one also has different uh, categories here as you can see on the screen each of them has a basis on some type of design criteria like air water light etc based on the score that a project achieves it can aim for three levels of certification silver gold and platinum what really uh, sets this rating system apart is two things firstly it has some mandatory features uh, or mandatory preconditions which are strategies that you have to absolutely do because the research showed that those are integral for human health and the second thing that makes it really set apart is that it requires third party performance verification so there's a person coming to the project post construction to do on site assessments and measurements to check that all the wellness criteria is being implemented correctly 
So really the unique characteristics of well are those features as well as the fact that it has pathways for core and shell projects that have only control over certain spaces. And then it also has a lot of synergies with other green rating systems. So if you are pursuing passive house or lead or any of the other systems, the team at Well really works with you to find a way to overlap the two systems and find synergies with them. The second uh, thing I want to talk about for Well is that in addition to the full certification, Well also has three different types of ratings, which are kind of subsets of the whole certification. The performance verification only looks at just looking at a few of those performance-based criteria and doing on-site testing without a full certification. The second one, the Well Health and Safety Rated, was born after the COVID-19 pandemic. So it has five action areas that primarily look at operations and management policies and protocols that you can do to really get people back into spaces with confidence and safety. The third one here is a newer one, which is the equity rating. And that one prioritizes inclusivity um, and innovative approaches for more equitable spaces. Now let's talk a little bit about FitWell. Uh, FitWell was created with the CDC and GSA in the United States, also focuses on human health and well-being, and also had collaboration with public health experts and other professionals. The structure for FitWell is that it has 12 categories, but unlike Well, you can see here that they are based on the place in the project. So they start from the outside, the location, the access, the entrances, and then it starts to go inside the building. So it depends on the different spaces in the project. One thing to note here is that FitWell has no mandatory requirements. So they provide you a menu of options and you can really choose which of those you would like to focus for your particular project. I also want to note that both Well and FitWell have recertification requirements. So they uh, request you to recertify the project every three years to ensure that all the wellness aspects are still working as designed. So the USP of FitWell is really that it offers a variety of scorecards for each building type or occupant. For instance, as you can see here, you have scorecards for different types of tenants, commercial interiors, multifamily, senior housing, uh, commercial site and retail. So for instance, if you were doing a senior housing project, the FitWell scorecard would be particularly relevant to elderly residents. So looking at things like accessibility, safety, et cetera. Whereas maybe if you looked at the multifamily scorecard, you'd be looking at residents living in an apartment building, who care about amenities and noise control and things like that. So each of these scorecards really focuses on the occupant in these spaces. FitWell also has a certification for existing buildings. So you can never be too late to look at a health and wellness uh, certification if you were to go with that one. So since both of these rating systems are looking at wellness, I just want to talk about how to choose between these two systems. So when to choose well over fit well. So choose well if you're looking for a comprehensive but fairly rigorous certification. Well is really rigorous in terms of its requirements, detailed uh, metrics, and it's also really keen on exceptional quality assurance because of the performance testing. So if your client is really looking for that exceptional quality, this is the rating system for you. It also has a global presence because there are projects that are adopting well all over the world. And it also has some technological integrations with sensors and circadian lighting and uh, strategies like that. I do want to note though that to pursue well, make sure that you have good financial uh, budgeting uh, because it does have much higher certification costs compared to FitWell. And it also takes longer because the performance verification only happens after the occupancy of the building. So this might be more suited for projects like corporates, headquarters, high-end developments, campuses, etc. 
when would you choose FitWell? So FitWell is better if you're looking for a more straightforward and practical implementation. It's more flexible, it's more adaptable, it has no mandatory requirements, it has lower certification fees, so it may be a better fit for small scale projects or projects with just limited resources or someone who just wants to dip their feet into wellness without going into a very detailed rating system. It's also really great for projects that are not your typical office for like multifamily and any spaces which have multiple tenants because you have focus scorecards for these. There are also some differences in the design criteria among both. As you can see here, these are the four um, wellness components that I see the most differences in. And FitWell looks at a more broad view of these, whereas Well has more extensive requirements with testing, with air, water, light, uh, and very specific metrics for some of these. Just to conclude, I wanted to show a project of ours here at Atelier 10 that has executed the well rating system, just so you see how uh, such a project may look, that pursued both a green rating system as well as a wellness system. This is the SOM New York office. Um, it's at 7 World Trade Center, the 27th and 28th floors. This achieved a well version 2 pilot platinum certification, which is the highest level. So some of the wellness features that you can see in these images are very apparent. And there are several others that are invisible, but they are quietly doing a lot in the background. I can mention a few here. You can see that there is a diversity of different workspaces. There's a really attractive and visible stairwell, which is connecting the floors. It has some cross laminated timber walls that are also acting as a biophilic design element through that wood materiality. You can see lots of natural light with careful selection of automated shading systems. There's a material strategy that was super rigorous as well. Uh, we had the team with wetting for non-toxic materials. There are also some air sensors in here for continuous monitoring. There are lots of acoustics strategies. And the materials used for the acoustic strategies were also vetted for wellness criteria. So you'll see there's felt, there's wood fibers, uh, there's a palette of caulk and fabric and materials like that as well that have been incorporated. That's all I had. I have a few resources here if you would like to read some more on wellness-based research and these certifications. I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you so much, Radna. Uh, and we will take questions in about a minute. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for this. I feel like we've just hit the tip of the iceberg and I'm sure we would like to see many more examples and I'm sure you have some, but um, yeah, thank you for the introduction to these standards. And, um, you know, at least speaking for myself, uh, I'm familiar with high performance certification, but some of these things are not so much on my radar. So it's cool to see how they can be incorporated and just make sure that we're always broadening our horizons. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think I will send it to Zach uh, for a message from sponsors. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Radna. That was fantastic. So a big thank you to the sponsors that make our work at Passive House Accelerator possible. So thank you to our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA. Oh, wait, you can't see that. There, NYSERDA. Uh, also, thank you to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Ingui Architecture, Glavel, Minotaur, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. And thanks, too, to our champion sponsors, Bewizo, Gradient, Icon Windows and Doors, Intelligent Membranes, PH Air Seal, and Source 2050. And thanks to our patron sponsors, Brennan Brennan, Euroline Windows, Holstrom System, Inotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Longboard, RDH Building Science, and Sanderson Sustainable Design. Thank you, sponsors. Yes, thank you, sponsors. Um, and we have a question um, from a couple folks, actually. If Radna, you wouldn't mind um, putting 
this last slide up again, uh, or the resource slide. There are some folks who wanted to get that copied down. Sure. I think that's the one. Thank you. Yeah, um, you know, I, one thing I also wanted to say is um, it's interesting to see, you know, what what everyone keeps thinking of in terms of what wellness means or what you know safety means. Um, and these were some great examples. I um, had a conversation the other day with um, a professor of interior design who focuses on um, accessibility and accessible design, and she was talking about various things, but also um, particularly like contrast between um, like light and dark colors so that people with vision impairment can can see things or lack of glare because it's actually a safety issue for a lot of people. So it's cool to see some of that being incorporated um, into these design standards. Um, okay. So we do have a few questions from the audience. Um, first up, we have Emma Roman. Uh, do, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Emma, if you're unable to unmute, I can go ahead and ask it for you. Yeah, I wasn't ready. You can ask from the chat. You sure? Yeah. OK. <laughs> All right, Emma asks, do you have data points for the economic value for property managers or owners? It makes sense intuitively, but ha whoops. Uh, but have you had a success presenting a business case with potential cost premiums of implementation measures versus improved retention or marketability? Yeah, that's a great question, Emma. And I must say that this is one of the most popular questions that we often get when we present something like this to our uh, clients for projects. Uh, the first thing they want to know, especially for their developers, is to know what's the business case for this and where's the data. Uh, maybe it's the way this is something, there's some links to this that I can share after this meeting, but there are some studies out there uh, that have looked into this and they are able to show what the retention is and these studies were basically looking at different buildings that had some of these different criteria that was implemented and what that did in terms of surveys, for instance, surveying the tenants in the building to ask them what was their uh, motivation to choose buildings or to retain uh, their leases, etc. Uh, so there are some surveys in that, as well as there's also some business cases that were made in terms of the uh, monetary value of doing something like this, what was the first cost of uh, implementing some of these strategies as well as the paybacks to that. So maybe I can share those studies with you. That would be great. Emma, does that kind of answer your question there? Yeah, the links would be awesome if you're able to share it after. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll make sure to circulate that. Um, and Radha, do you, do you remember anything from there that kind of stood out to you or jumped out to you at, in terms of, um, you know, motivating factors? Maybe I, you don't need to like give numbers. I think that's probably harder to remember, but if there are any specific motivating factors, maybe that would be helpful for people. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it, it really varies, but one thing that those studies really show is that not every person is the same. So we really need to stop designing our buildings to be uh, maybe very standardized, but actually providing that variety and diversity. I think you were just mentioning something like this, so about uh, being inclusive and accessible to everyone. So one thing that really stood out in the studies to me is people valuing that everyone had a space for what they needed. For instance, there was a diversity in the types of acoustic spaces. There were some quiet areas, there were some areas where someone who wanted to be, who had certain requirements for their own well-being could find that kind of space in the building. So there's that kind of uh, inclusivity for everyone, as well as everybody prefers, let's say, a different thermal <laughs> comfort. Sometimes we women have <laughs> a little uh, hard time getting what we need. So these uh, Studies also showed that looking at thermal comfort in that way, to have a variety of different spaces, thermal delight is what they call it, 
is also something that was really valued by tenants to be able to say that this they had that option to move around and to find the right space for them. So all of these really impact um, how people feel in a space, for them to have that choice to be where they think uh, they need to be for their own well-being. Great, good point. And Emily Dodson says, ooh, thermal delight. <laughs> good term. Um, and what motivated you to um, kind of delve into this wellness world um, and and what, I guess, allowed you to start working on um, on projects that incorporated this? Yeah, I think a lot of it came from, um, like I said earlier when I was talking about our firm at Elliot 10, it's kind of in our ethos. Uh, for every project, that's one of the factors that we always consider. Um, so it really came from there. When I first joined, that was something that we always looked at for every project. But with more and more scientific literature that comes in, my father is a doctor, so <laughs> he always spoke about these things. Uh, he works with cancer patients, and he would talk about how the space in which uh, the healing happens or the space where they sit down for their chemotherapy for several hours matters. Uh, it really plays with their mental health on where they're sitting while they're doing a certain thing, how that space is designed, even the ceiling that they're continuously staring at. So all of these conversations around the dinner table was always at the back of my mind. But as we started to do more of these projects, it really hit me about how that wellness aspect really matters for all of us. Because once we're in that building, we are in that space and it really impacts how we feel at the end of the day and our thoughts. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just being in a space that, uh, you know, is like beautiful to you can feel a lot better just for well-being. I think we can all experience and know that one. Um, next up, we're surprising people today. Um, Hans Eich, you had a question. Did you want to unmute and ask? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I noticed that you said that it needs recertification every three years. And to me, a lot of these features sound like hard features. So I wonder how much deterioration of that uh, do you find? Yeah, and so that's a good question. So I think the intent of recertification is to just make sure that the quality remains over time. And what you're talking about maybe is material deterioration, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would think that there's sometimes an aversion or trying to stay away from, you know, that ongoing uh, mm -hmm. cost uh, right. certification. I agree. And that is definitely something that uh, most clients also ask about. Uh, but I think the intent really there is to make sure that maybe you've designed a certain system, it's gone into um, implementation, the building has come in operation, but two years down the line, nobody has gone in and calibrated that or it stopped working or something's not doing what it needs to do. And then it just falls off the crack. So one of the intent of this is when you recertify, you're going back in checking your air monitors, seeing if the display is working right. You're going and checking in that all your thermostats are doing what it needs to do. You're going in and checking that all of your plants are where they need. So you're basically going and seeing that all the strategies, it's kind of like a revision for the facilities management to make sure that everything is as operational as it needs to be. So my understanding is that the recertification, the intent is to go back to make sure that none of the wellness strategies are losing their value over time. Yeah, it makes sense, cool. It really needs to be part of the regular maintenance then of the, of the buildings. It does, yes. I know we do commissioning typically, uh, but that also ends at a certain time, a couple of months after occupancy, but the intent here is to go back and keep checking. There's also these, these rating systems, I didn't get time to get into the operational aspects of it, but they do have policy requirements from the owner side. So the owner has to put together certain healthy building policies. Um, so those are also something that are revisited in these recertifications to make sure that the owner is still offering those benefits. For instance, offering a subsidy to go to a fitness center within a certain mile of your office is one option they provide. So you're just trying to encourage people to go 
work out. So things like that are also rechecked in these uh, recertification rounds. Yeah, and like LEAD has, um, what is it, a, a credit for continuous commissioning, right? Is this like kind of a, a similar concept there, but like a requirement instead for, for well? Mm -hmm. Yes, for both well and fit well. Do you think that Passive House and other standards should incorporate more of that um, recertification or continuous commissioning, or do you think it should be, we should design so that it's not required or, or maybe some sort of balance of those? Um, yeah, that's a tricky question. I think Passive House already builds in the performance verification piece where you're actually going and testing it. Uh, but I don't see what could deteriorate over time uh, as much as maybe with the wellness strategy. So may not be super useful there if it's constructed correctly. And yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, we do have room for some more questions. So if anything comes to you, the audience, um, please do put it in the chat or um, send it to Kara. Um, but we've got a, a couple other questions here, including um, the uh, classic next gen question, uh, which is what do you think is next for the future of passive house or high performance? Um, what I think is next for high performance, I think it's going to be a whole lot of more and more focus on building materials. Uh, we're seeing a lot of push and awareness on healthy building materials that go in the building. So I think more and more manufacturers are getting forced to create these documents where they're disclosing what's in our building materials. And I think that's going to become more and more prevalent as all of our rating systems start to push um, because we're only choosing products that have these declarations. So we're going to uh, essentially force the building industry to start to disclose, like I said, also for us to be more mindful of everything that goes in the buildings. So I think the next thing for high performance building is not only just high performing with energy, but also high performing in terms of the toxicity uh, being avoided in our building materials. Well, yeah, and we have these uh, above code programs um, that, you know, maybe they will make their way into code or um, as as the standard. So, um, yeah, I think we are getting there and it seems like um, people are starting to be really aware of healthier building materials and like red lists. Um, so it's it's good to see. Um, and I think we have things like this to to thank for that. Um, so, uh, we sometimes talk about, uh, building things in and kind of stealth mode, um, at Passive House Accelerator where, you know, you might, um, you might not tell a client, oh, we are, uh, making you a Passive House, um, and, but you still deliver something that is Passive House and say, oh, by the way, you're welcome. Um, is are there any elements that in your work now, regardless of whether they're well or fit well or lead or whatever they might be, um, where you're incorporating these principles and which ones are those? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, like I said, certifications are more of just a framework to be able to put together a certain point threshold or a certain rating to what you're doing. But we as a firm, do make sure that irrespective of whether they're certifying or not, we do consider health and wellness as a factor in the design. And I'm just gonna bring back up that slide with all the components here. So we have it as reference, but I do think that the ones here that are preventing harm, which is air, water, and materials are like our core uh, components that we do want to uh, incorporate because those are the ones that are really preventative. So you're preventing any contaminants, you're preventing any material uh, toxicity. And then the rest of these from visual, thermal, acoustic, biophilia, etc., are more of enhancements. 
So those are the ones that you're helping the building get better enhanced in terms of the comfort, uh, visual, et cetera. So I think the first three are like the first step, uh, which is always prevention. And then the next few are the enhancements to make your building more and more uh, better. Great. Um, Zach, you had a question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so Rana, you, you mentioned the um the ways that passive house and and wellness, both well and fit well, are have some alignment. Are there places where that particular places where you see um uh tension um or where it's more difficult to achieve achieve uh the goals of of well or fit well when you're doing a passive house and and then maybe some if so are what are some strategies that you see to help navigate that yeah that's a good question and one that i have been asked before as well i don't see any direct tension zach in terms of something that's like entirely contradictory to each other uh but i do want to note that in terms of uh things like ventilation and uh, which are relating to like how you have heat recovery and things like that. Sometimes you might have to look at both of those rating systems together just to like break it down of what the intent and requirements are uh, because they're slightly different. They're doing ultimately towards the same goal, but they have a different lens of looking at things. But what well does is that if you have a certain requirement from a different rating system, they are open to have that conversation to say, hey, this is an alternative compliance path I want to do mm -hmm. because we think it meets the passive house requirements and it also meets your intent. So we won't do it in the process you're outlining, but we'll do it this way to still get sort of that common goal. So they do have that flexibility to work with them, um, which is what you could do. But I don't see anything that's a direct contradiction as such. Right. Right. So in in the case of ventilation, for example, one of, the, one of the wellness certifications perhaps would have higher requirements for CFM, mm -hmm. which which in some circumstances increases wellness, but maybe in others doesn't necessarily. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And right. that's that's exactly the example, uh, which is perfect for this, where you can just negotiate to say what it does and how you'd want to uh, propose an alternative way to get there. Right. Right. Great, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. Um, so I think we can go ahead and wrap up early unless we get anything in the next like five seconds. Just some just some links, some resources. All right. Well, thank you so much, Radna. I think this is a, like a fantastic kind of different um, different program for us. Um, and I hope this is really helpful for everyone to um, start incorporating a little bit more of health and wellness and kind of looking at what that might mean from different angles. So um, yeah, really appreciate this. This is fascinating. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Radha. Appreciate it.